Good morning and welcome to worship on Holy Trinity Sunday. We're so glad you could join us on this Memorial Day weekend. Also, before we begin worship, I'd like to ask Bob Seamer to share with us some announcements. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning on Trinity Sunday. This is also Memorial Day weekend, and we trust that you're having a thoughtful and meaningful observance as we honor those who have given their all for our country. Senate Assembly is this coming Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We will be electing we will be electing a new bishop. A new bishop. I'm trying to just switch the spotlight here, but anyway, we'll be electing a new bishop, and please keep your assembly in your prayers. Our voting members are Margie Brown, Sandy Nelson, and Pastor Steve. Because of the pandemic, the assembly will be conducted online, and should you be interested, you can also log on and observe what's going on at the assembly. Next Sunday, June 6th, we will have a worship provided by the Senate Assembly worship team. This should be really special with great music. We will provide the link so you can access the worship service in the usual ways we do on Sunday, simply by clicking in the Gloria Day Zoom worship link. If you need to visit the church building this week for any reason, please wear a mask for everyone's protection. Please join us for a community connection at 2 o'clock on Tuesday on Zoom. The link can be found on our website. Wednesday, adult education is now on a hiatus until fall. Thank you to all those who participated in our class on the Franciscan Way. Joyce this week, Vicki and Steve Gamber's anniversary is on Friday the 4th. Fernando Chavez's birthday will be on Sunday the 6th. For those of you using Zoom, you can use the chat button at the bottom of your screen to submit prayer requests for the prayers of intercession. Please remember to send in your tithes and offerings or contribute online through our website. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Let's prepare our hearts for worship with a thanksgiving for baptism. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia. Refreshed by the resurrection life we share in Christ, let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We thank you, risen Christ, for the waters where you make us new, leading us from death to life, from tears to joy. We bless you, risen Christ, that your spirit comes to us in the grace-filled waters of rebirth, like rains to our thirsting earth, like streams that revive our souls, like cups of cool water shared with strangers. Breathe your peace on your church when we hide in fear. Clothe us with your mercy and forgiveness. Send us companions on our journey as we share your life. Make us one, risen Christ. Cleanse our hearts, shower us with life. To you be given all praise with the Holy Spirit and the glory of God, now and forever. Amen. Let's join in singing our gathering song, Come Join the Dance of Trinity.
the day. God of heaven and earth, before the foundation of the universe and the beginning of time, you are the triune God, author of creation, eternal world of word of salvation, life-giving wisdom. Guide us to all by truth by your spirit, that we may proclaim all that are Christ, as revealed and rejoice in the glory he shares with us. Glory and praise to you, Father and Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. The first reading is from Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two, they covered their faces, and with two, they covered their feet, and with two, they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now this has touched your lips. Your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. The second reading is from Romans 8. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we crawl, call Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If, in fact, we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Word, word of, of wisdom, wisdom, word of life. Thank, thank, thanks thanks be to God. God. The Holy Gospel according to John, the third chapter, beginning at the first verse. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I've told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. 
And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my Redeemer and my Rock. Excuse me, I have the wrong script on my screen. Dear Nicodemus, I owe you an apology. I confess that I have not always held you in very high esteem. The fact is, in the past, I thought you were, how to say this, too cautious and, well, a little more than a little timid. And if I'm being really honest, I sometimes thought that you were not the sharpest quill in the inkwell. I'm sorry I was so very quick to judge you. I confess I hadn't really read the story from your point of view. I realize now, Nicodemus, that it was actually very brave of you to seek out Jesus that night when you two sat down to talk. Nothing timid about it. Some people think you came at night because you didn't want to be seen talking to the um, enemy. That's the frame a lot of people put around your meeting with Jesus. They see the antagonism and contempt that some of your fellow Pharisees had for Jesus. But to be fair, he gave as good as he got really better. Anyway, people see that enmity in this back and forth with your fellow Pharisees, so they assume that you came to that meeting that night with a little malice and a big agenda. I hadn't really thought about it before, Nicodemus, but I can see now how much was at stake for you. John says that you were an archon, a leader or ruler of the people, And the language he uses indicates that you were a most highly respected teacher among the people. Plus, you were wealthy. You had standing in your community as a righteous man blessed by God. You had a big reputation to protect, and you were putting all that at risk in order to have a meeting of the minds with a man whom many of your community regarded as a troublemaker. That could have badly tarnished your your reputation And I admire you for putting that concern aside so that you could have an honest, personal discussion with Jesus, rabbi to rabbi. Having said all that, I realize now that you probably came at night simply to avoid the crowds. I see now that you were, I see now that what you wanted was a real conversation with someone who cared deeply about the same things you cared about. Some have said that your coming at night was symbolic. They see you as a caricature of those who walk in darkness. That idea makes a certain kind of sense based on the ways that John's gospel uses the themes of light and darkness. But since you came to Jesus, who later calls himself the light of the world, wouldn't it make more sense to see you as someone who is moving out of darkness and into the light? You remind us that faith is a process. Understanding unfolds by degrees. Too often we forget that. I've also been thinking, Nicodemus, about that first thing you said to Jesus when you sat down to talk. Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. It's kind of sad, really. But in our time and our culture, 
when someone greets you with flattery like that, our first impulse is to hold on to our wallets. But I've come to think that you were really in earnest when you said it. You showed him such respect, calling him rabbi and acknowledging not just the powerful things he had done, but the source of that power. You acknowledged his relationship with the one he called father, though you couldn't possibly have understood the true nature of that relationship. But then who does? Oh, we have no shortage of doctrinal formulas and illustrations to describe that relationship. Relationships, really, because the Holy Spirit is part of that eternal dance of love we call the Trinity. But when you get right down to it, who can really understand the relationship between the Maker, the Christ, and the Spirit? We recite the illustrations and restate the formulas and think that because we found some language to corral it, we understand that mystic communion of love that is God. Our language itself betrays our lack of real understanding. In naming them Father, Son, and Spirit, we insert a separateness between them and ascribe roles. That's the antithesis of their relationship, their existence, their being, where they cannot and will not be separate. As Frederick Buechner said, they are the mystery beyond us, the mystery within us and the mystery among us. And it's all one deep and eternal mystery that gives us life. The best we can do is enter the mystery and experience and understand that we'll never completely understand. St. Augustine said it's like trying to pour the ocean into a seashell. Speaking of understanding, I now understand that I've greatly misunderstood your conversation with Jesus. When I dug a little deeper, did a little more homework, I came to realize that the dialogue between you two was typical of the ways rabbis talked to each other and mulled over ideas in your time. I didn't realize before that you were actually inviting Jesus to elaborate more on the being born from above when you asked, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? You gave the obvious dunce response to Jesus so that he had a reason to go deeper into what he was teaching. It was a rhetorical device. You're far from a dunce, Nicodemus. I may be wrong, but your dialogue with Jesus now sounds to me like you and he were using a familiar and respected rabbinic method to engage in a kind of team teaching for the disciples. And you, with grace and humility, played the role of the not-so-bright student. Even when Jesus says, are you a teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? It reads to me now as if he's using you as a foil. And you, great teacher that you are, you graciously play along. You help him make the point to those gathered around and listening that these are not simple, easy concepts to grasp, these things that you too were discussing. Even a great teacher of Israel has to wrestle with these ideas. You help him spur the other listeners into thinking more deeply and opening their minds and hearts more fully to the mystery of God in, with, under, and around them. You give them permission to have questions. If you're wondering why I've reassessed my opinion of you, Nicodemus, it's because I took a good look at the two other times you're mentioned in John's Gospel, particularly that time in chapter 7 when the other Pharisees in the Sanhedrin are upset with the temple police for not arresting Jesus. They throw shade on him because he's from Galilee, which is just pure prejudice. They say he should be arrested for misleading the people because he does not know the law. But you stood up for him and with perfect irony said, our law does not judge people without first giving them a hearing to find out what they're doing, does it? That one cost you, I know. Somebody in that group tried to throw shade on you too when he said, are you from Galilee too? Nobody's ever heard of a prophet coming from Galilee. 
but I think you were maybe beginning to suspect that he was really, that he really was a prophet and maybe something more than a prophet, even if he was from Galilee. And then there's that other thing you did. That beautiful, generous, heartbreaking thing. You were there when he was crucified. When his disciples had deserted him, you stayed right there at the foot of the cross. And when you and Joseph of Arimathea took his body down from the cross, you brought a mixture of myrrh and spices, a hundred pounds of myrrh and spices to prepare his body for a decent burial, even though the scripture said he was cursed for hanging on a tree. Some have said that in preparing his body, you were betraying that you didn't really believe he was, what he had said about resurrection. Well, if that's the case, it's no shame on you. Nobody else believed it either. Not then, anyway. No, that was an extravagant act of deep respect. One teacher for another. That was an act of love. And that's why, Nicodemus, I've had to revisit what I thought about you. I realized that you were a person of profound integrity and generosity of spirit. I realized that you were a righteous man. I realized that I had no right to judge you to begin with. So please forgive me, Nicodemus. And please know, teacher of Israel, that you've taught me a great deal. In Jesus' name. Growing in faith, lifted by hope, guided by love, we come to the triune God in prayer. We pray, O oh God, for your holy church around the world. Revitalize us and renew us, that we may be reborn once again through the waters of baptism and the blowing wind of your spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear prayer. our prayer. We give you thanks for your power revealed in creation, for cedar and oak trees and towering redwoods, for rushing waters and surging waves, for all the ways we experience your presence in, with, and under the things of this amazing world. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. We pray for the nations and our leaders, that by your spirit that they would work towards a world where all your children enjoy peace. We pray especially this day for peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Lord, in your mercy, Hear, our, Hear prayer. our prayer. God of love, fill Gloria Day with gratitude for the gifts we have received from you. Renew our ministries and help us make new and lasting connections with our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We pray for healing for those who suffer, especially victims and survivors of violence. Give respite to those living with PTSD or any other mental concerns. We pray especially for Lance Hailstone, Matthew Erickson, Harry Plummer, Baby Arthur, Peggy Bachman, Charlie Hartwell, Mike Engel, Janet Sims, Vicki Gammer, Jim Shoup, Diane Kyle, Judy Mello, Dee Peretta, Renee Wright, Brooklyn and her family, Ken Rhoda, the friends and family of Coach John Gonzalez, who passed due to COVID Friday night. And for those on our prayer wall, reveal your power to heal and save. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear prayer. our prayer. We give you thanks, O God, for all those who have served our country with their very lives. especially on this holiday weekend. We're mindful of those who made the ultimate sacrifice that they sought to preserve our country in integrity and truth 
that they sought to preserve. We give you thanks too that this nation still shines as a beacon of hope for those seeking a better life. And we're especially moved to celebrate with Pastor Mar Marta in her joy in becoming a US citizen this week. All these prayers we lay before you, Holy Trinity, trusting in your abiding grace and love as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. On the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body broken for you. Do this often and as you eat it, remember me, the body of Christ broken for you. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and again he gave thanks, then gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink it. This cup is a new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this often, and as you drink it, remember me. The blood of Christ shed for you. And now, Holy Spirit, eternal Trinity, who come to us in, with, and under all things, including this bread and wine, keep us and sustain us until now, until life everlasting. Amen. Let's join in singing our sending song, Eternal Father, Strong to Save. <laughs>
the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord's face shine on us and may the Lord be gracious to us. May the Lord look upon us with favor and draw us ever deeper into the mystery beyond us, the mystery among us, and the mystery within us. And as we live in the joy of that eternal dance of the three in one, may we know peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve each other, to love and serve your neighbors, to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm.